they discriminate the whole race. Uh, even if they've like only interacted with the least worthy members. Yeah. And by the way, that does continue. That is the hard part about being a police officer. When you're a police officer, who do you largely interact with? The least worthy. The members. least worthy. You, you interact with criminals, largely. And so if 90% of the people that you interact with are criminals and they're lying to you, what does that now do to your view of humanity? People are lying. What's that? People are lying. Yeah, you think that everyone's a liar. Everyone's trying to pull something over on you. Even if you're conscious of it. Even if you sit there and go, well, no, it's just because of who I work with all day. It slowly starts to trickle into your life in, in every other area. It's one of the reasons that divorce rates are so high among police officers and domestic violence rates are so high among police officers. We might look at that and go, that's because super violent people kind of go in there and they become police officers. There's an aspect of that. True. But... Think about that. If every day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, you're interacting with people, and, you're, and it's not just that everyone's lying to you, but you're seeing some of the worst stuff in, in the world. You know, I mentioned earlier that, that his name was Perry Barnes. Uh, you know, I bet if you looked him up, you'd probably find some stuff on Google. I, I haven't, but I'm curious. I'm going I'm to do that when I, after this is over. Um, Perry was, was, was trying to get me to join the LAPD. So I went through. I did all the tests and everything. I did the, did the interviews and all that stuff. And my dad was, um, you know, came, to, came and talked to me. And he said, listen, you kind of got a little far on this process. So are you really thinking about doing this? And I wasn't, I was kind of like on the fence. I, wanted, I just wanted to see if I could. And, he, uh, and my dad tells me a story. He says, listen, just let me tell you a story. And then you can figure out afterwards if you still want to be a cop. And you tell me that um, when he, he lived in the San Fernando Valley, which is outside of Los Angeles when he was younger. And um, he, was, he wanted to become a sheriff's officer. He was thinking about it. You know, he didn't start the process, but he was thinking about it. And in his apartment, it's one of the apartments that, like, you, it's like a courtyard there. Like, you walk out, it's like a, like a square railing, you know, like a courtyard in the middle. And so he came out, because he heard a commotion. And he, and he looks over, and there's a guy who has, like, a, an infant, a baby. And he's holding it over the railing, like he's going to drop it down uh, two, two stories. And there, there are sheriff's officers walking up on him on both sides, going like, Sir, just calm down. So essentially, this is a guy who's threatening to murder a baby. I don't, know if it was, I don't know if it was his baby or, or what the deal was, but they're telling him, sir, please, just, you know, and, and so at one point, he gets to, he's holding the baby, he's holding it, and he gets distracted, and he turns like this, and one of the officers from this side just immediately dives on the dude, tackles him. They, they're able to, to, to get the baby, pull him back in, they save the infant. And my dad said that he realized at that moment he was not cut out to be a, a sheriff's officer, because his immediate reaction was, kick his ass. You know, you look over there, and someone's doing that to a baby, uh, I wonder how many of you, that would be your reaction, too. Like, you're looking around, are there cameras? Because <laughs> this guy needs, needs an ass kicking. Um, how many people would you come across in life that that would be your, your, your initial reaction? And my dad asked me, what would you, how would you feel if you were in that situation? Because he said that the cops dove in, handcuffed him, took him away. And he said, what would you have done? Oh, I said, oh, I'd have kicked his ass, no doubt. I probably have dumped his ass over the railing and said he resisted. My dad said, you are not cut out to be a police officer. <laughs> I said, you are, you are probably right about that. And at that point, I kind of realized, like, shoot, I could get however long into this thing, and I'm not just going to lose my career. I'm going to end up in jail for doing something like that. I don't have the temperament for it. And so imagine if, if you put someone like me under lots and lots and lots of those kinds of, of scenarios. It almost becomes impossible for me to imagine how someone could not become jaded and messed up. That's why there's talk about, like, with police officers having to rotate them off the street and into other things, because if you're constantly coming across the worst elements of a, of a, of a community, <clears throat> there's a very good chance that you're going to treat the whole community with that kind of disdain. And I don't know what y'all's um, interactions with, with cops are like, but coming from Los Angeles, mine were just terrible across the board, man. I remember I came to San Diego, and I was in San Diego for, like, two weeks or something like that. I went to a 7-Eleven, and I was standing there getting ready to pay for something, and then a, a cop walks up and stands behind me. He's buying something also. And the cop goes, hey, how you doing today? And I'm like, because oh. <laughs> in LA, the cops don't care how you're doing. They want to mess with you. And that was my experience growing up. And I was just like, man, I even do nothing, dude. And I'm even an adult now. <laughs> and I just said, doing all right, man. How are you? <laughs> he says, oh man, how am I doing? He says, it's sunny out, it's San Diego, the weather's beautiful, what more could you ask for? And I'm thinking, like, I could ask to not be harassed and thrown in jail for the weekend. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, I hear you. And the guy asked me, are you from, he said, are you from San Diego? 
And then the same thing, the cops on LA, they only ask you questions because they're looking, they're looking for something wrong. And I just said, uh, no, no, I'm from Los Angeles, so just moved down here about two weeks ago. He says, oh, you're from LA? Dude, you're going to love it. He says, you're going to love San Diego. The weather, the people, everything's beautiful here. I'm like, great. <laughs> I pay for it, and I go and I leave, and I did, like my, the old, old kind of instincts kick in. I sit down in my car, and I just wait. And, I let, and the cop comes out, and he goes, and he leaves. And when he leaves, then I leave. So I'm not going to leave and then have him follow me and then pull me over for something. That's just kind of what I was used to. And so this guy was, was so completely different from every other cop I'd ever interacted with in my whole life. And I was like, is it possible that it was just LAPD? It was also possible because of where I was hanging out, who I was hanging out with, what we were doing. And I, I, I came across the cops who were expecting the worst elements of us. Was I always doing something wrong? No. Yes. Maybe. Maybe. A little bit of something wrong. But I encountered some terrible things, man. And it becomes hard now because now I can come to you and say, not all police officers remember. But man, how many times do you have to be wrong before you have an experience that completely changes or even destroys your life? It could just be one incident. I you know, you come across that one cop. What's that? I almost got arrested on New Year's. How? Setting off fireworks. Setting off fireworks? Yeah, an undercover cop pulled up after and was like, you know, it's illegal and turned on his lights. They got time for that? I'm, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Dude, how did it? I heard more gunfire this year on, well, I guess last year, on New Year's Eve than I've ever heard in my life. From, you know, for some reason, like, my, my neighbor, I live in South Park. It's a real place. No, that's, just, that's just a cartoon. <laughs> I live in South Park. I've never heard that much, that much gunfire. I'm <laughs> sitting there, but hey, I, I, uh, I'll leave it at that. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of gunfire, man. I think of other examples of this too. Like I, I interact with students not too often anymore, but a lot of times students come in, they just like real pissed off. Why? I hate teachers. What the hell? Why? What did I do? I didn't, I didn't go to your house, but you came to my, came to my classroom. You know, I, I'm sure you've come across teachers in the past. And by the way, similarly, teachers will do that with students too. There's a teacher on campus who I happen to know has a particular dislike for football players and cheerleaders. And it's a teacher who many of you certainly know. And they, they, they've, I've heard them express this before in meetings. And I've heard the, you know, stories about them. I, they're just stories, of course. I don't believe every story that I, that I hear. I believe very few of them. But it came from this teacher's own mouth. Why? I'm going to guess if you knew who the teacher was, you, I think you might understand why they don't like cheerleaders and therefore football players. Probably not a lot of attention from football players and, and cheerleaders when they were in high school. And they come back to high school and they kind of carry out that, that same uh, life from back then. It's, it's just high school 2.0 for, for a lot of times for people. So thinking about that, it's the, worth, the least worthy members. Maybe we should seek out the most worthy members. But it's just easier for us because those are the ones that stand out to us. How many, um, example I used last period was when you're driving down the street and someone cuts you off and we just get so angry and we're like, oh my God, people are so stupid, drivers are so terrible. How many drivers did you come across that day? 100, 200, 1,000? And like one person cuts you off and you judge all drivers by that one person who probably was even just stupid, probably just absent-minded, not paying attention, like you've never made a mistake when you're driving before. No. So maybe rather than see that, we can look at it and that should stand out to us like, I just got cut off. That's interesting. That's like probably like 0.001% of all drivers I came across today. It's amazing how well this whole driving system works out. They ever been on the freeway before and think about that? You're driving in a car like 85 miles an hour, oh, sorry, 65 miles an hour. Driving in a car like 85, 90 miles an hour, and everyone is doing the same thing, and the only thing that stops us from killing each other are some painted lines in the road. <laughs> That's it. That's the only thing that stops us from just you know, banging into each other. Our respect for, for painted lines in the road. And somehow we all get to where we're going. And once in a while, there's an accident, you know? It's incredible how well so much of this stuff works. But we seem to remember how badly things work. Look at all my lights. Look at all the lights that are working. And I've got two that aren't. We talked about that earlier. I could bring Sal in here and be like, <laughs> but it's amazing we have lights at all. And if we didn't have lights, we could open up the blinds, we'd have light from outside. Yeah. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms,